for. <laughs> hey, everyone. Um, I am sitting here with Mr. Christian Lenti. Um, we are now in season four of the Sober Truth podcast, but if you've been following, you know that he was actually in season one. Um, and one of my first guests on uh, the podcast uh, years ago now. So um, he's here in person and uh, he's got an amazing story, a powerful ministry, and just an all around amazing person. Um, as you know, as you follow, you follow me, you know that I have a special love in my heart for people that are really willing to lay down their lives for the gospel. Anybody can be a bright, shining star for a year or two in ministry, but can you do it for the long haul? Can you lay down your life for uh, decades? And not everybody can. Christian can. Uh, him and his uh, amazing wife, Nui, who is off camera, but she's sitting here with us, um, have been living in Thailand for 21 years, um, which some of you listening may not even be 21 years old. So just imagine um, leaving America to go do ministry in a foreign country um, I, I, at a young age and deciding to stay for decades forsaking um, the very country that you grew up in and the comforts of that country to go and, and be um, in an area where you feel like the gospel is needed um, and needed in a way that most people are afraid to deliver because um, we're talking about the sex industry. We're talking about people with sex issues with sex. We're talking about broken people that are some of the most broken and willing to say, I'm going to lay down my life for that. Um, Christian is just an amazing person. I've been um, honored to be his friend for five years now and um, just honored to have him in person here today. He is on a tour currently of America, um, which we'll, we'll probably talk about, but he's got an amazing story and um, I just want to introduce you today to Mr. Christian Lenti. Oh, thank you, George. It's a real pleasure to be on this podcast. Um, it's good to see you. It's been a long time. Yeah, I guess it's been five years. It has been five years. A lot's happened in the world since then. <laughs> really? So, yeah. You wrote a book. Okay. Yes. <laughs> You're coming out with the I second did. book? <laughs> coming out with the second book? Yes, yes, yes. So a lot has happened. A yeah, lot has happened. Yeah. yeah, and I'm working on a third. So. Are you really? Yeah, I really am. I'm so. going to have to get some I have to get some, uh, some, <laughs> some tips on yes. how to write books. Chat GPT, baby. <laughs> Chat GPT. Just kidding. Chat GPT wasn't even out when I wrote my first two. Oh, that's but, great. Um, yeah, so Christian, you are, uh, like I said in the intro, just an amazing person. And um, I guess we start with your ministry, MSD Project, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And why don't you give us the elevator speech of what it is you are and do? Yeah, sure. Uh, the MSD Project stands for Mentoring Men, Strengthening Marriages, and Teaching Truth. And since the last time we met, you know, when, when the MST project started, we were a ministry reaching out primarily to men who visit red light districts. And so, you know, around the world, red light districts are, are prevalent, especially in different parts of the world like Europe and Southeast Asia. And so when the ministry started, our focus was to go into these areas and to begin conversations with men to say, hey, look, is everything you're looking for, is it going to be found in this environment? And if it's not, are you open to where it might be found? Building relationship, starting discipleship, even before discipleship was understood. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's how the, MS, uh, the MST project started. But over the years, there was a point where I really sensed God was saying, look, if, are you only interested in men who go to red light districts, or are you interested in just men in general? Because if you're open to men in general, there's yeah. a lot of need, there's a lot of brokenness, there's a lot of opportunity and there's a lot of open doors. And, and it was at that moment, George, that I said, you know, God, the ministry started by reaching out to men who visit red light districts, but it's not confined to men who are visiting red light districts. Mm -hmm. So yes, Lord, if there are men anywhere with whatever issue, if we can meet them, talk with them, bring them back to your word and see you really bring about a, a work of healing, uh, a work of restoration and of wholeness, then here I am. That's amazing. And that's how the ministry has continued to expand to this point. How did you, how did you end up there? I mean, I, I know you've told me the story before, but for our listeners, how did you end up in Thailand? Yes. Where are you originally from? Yeah, so grew up, uh, born, in, born in South America, grew up uh, throughout the States, um, 
But like a lot of kids, grew up in a single parent household, and I don't, you know, I'm not blaming anyone. I'm not, you know, mad at anyone for that. Just mm-hmm. it's just the reality of life. But in that, just a lot of just issues that I, I was dealing with, um, or actually at that time not dealing with. Yeah, uh, a lot of rejection and hurt, and just dealing with that in, in really unhealthy and unholy ways. Not not even a believer at that time. But what I began to see is that God wanted to work in my heart more than just alter my behavior. And, you know, I was going to church, knowing knowing the right things to say, knowing the right things to do, but there was just this, it was just a, just brokenness in my heart. And I just sensed that God was wanting to, you know, as, La- as Max Lucado says, Jesus looks at our heart and says, I can heal that if you want. And I said, I think I'm ready for that. And just in that own personal experience and, and, and just work that God did, just really developed a heart for men uh, worldwide. Right. Um, you know, came to Thailand as a, as a short-term missionary to visit a friend, loved it, loved the culture, loved the weather, loved everything about it. Um, since God was calling me into a career in missions, uh, prayed, felt like the Lord was calling me back to Thailand, been there ever since. When I first went to Thailand, I was doing a different ministry, you know, working with short-term teams that were coming into the country. But there was one time where I was just praying, and, and I just knew that I wasn't wasn't living the best life that I could live. You know, it's like that, mm-hmm. you know, be all that you can be, you know, and I just wasn't being all that I can be. I, I just recognized that there was a lot of still anger and frustration in my life and, and just dealing with with just, just, I think, a lot of pain. And one day I was just at church, and I just felt like God said, you know, I, I want to— I want to work in you and mold you so that you look like my son, Jesus. And uh, that's when I just really, really kind of really recommitted that that walk for, for holiness and purity and really overall Christ-like maturity. And it's it's been a wild ride ever since. A wild ride. Yeah. I love, that's how yeah. you do it. So. It's been a wild ride ever since, yeah. So Thailand, I think I have had the opportunity um well, actually, when we met five years ago, you're like, yeah, come on, I'll, uh, you know, show you a good time. And mm-hmm. and then COVID hits, right. and obviously yeah. it wasn't a possibility. So hopefully before, between now and the next time you come back to America, I do get out to Thailand. Yeah. Um, now, I'm just interested. I don't, I know you've been there for so long, but aware of the stereotypes that come with Thailand. Sure. Um, you know, it's almost like the America in the movies and stuff paints Thailand is nothing but this sex right. place where, right, where, right. where people go. Right. So w- what are some of the stereotypes that are not true about Thailand and, and maybe some of the things that are true, but misunderstood? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, I think there is that stereotype that there's Thailand is just a place where you can go and engage in immorality. And in a way that in a way it's not, not, unavailable it is available um that is that is a fact what i think isn't true is that uh, god is not at work in thailand it is true that you can go and engage in immorality it's it's not a, it's not a, a secret at all but what is not known as much i think is is what is god doing in that area and what he's doing is he's reaching into the hearts of men and he's working in those hearts and what we're able to do through faithfulness and obedience is is be a part of that work. Mm. Mm-hmm. That's a beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah, it is. Are you so, in Bangkok? Yeah, I, I do live in Bangkok, a city of twelve million or so. I don't know, maybe give or take a million or two. Uh, <laughs> so there's a there's, 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 there's a, a lot, lot of people. people. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of people in the city. Uh, but uh, yeah, I live in Bangkok. I've been there for uh, just over twenty one years. Mm-hmm. Have now? Did you have you since you've been here? Have you seen the movie that's out, The Sound of Freedom? I have not, but you're the third person to bring it up, so I think I think we're gonna have to go see it soon. Well, I, but I've I, heard about it. Yes, I think everything in a, you know the world. Uh, well, I can't say the world. I mean, in America in particular, everything mm-hmm. has become politicized in ways that it's right. like I, I can't believe this is political. Like. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but somehow this movie has found itself into the... Mm. I've seen the movie. I didn't find it political at all. I didn't find it the least bit um, weird or conspiratorial. I, th- I felt like it was a pretty direct story about one man who found right. some children that were being abducted, and he went in right. and made a difference. Right. That's all. There's right. not any other this craziness. But, um, you know, the point is of whether or not sex, you know, trade is happening with children. Mm. In in Thailand's mentioned in the in the movie. It's, oh, is it okay? Yeah, it's yeah. 
Is that something that like is uh, you're aware of? Um, it's not anything that our ministry deals with, but there are ministries such as International Justice Mission and others that would be. I actually uh, think that may have been mentioned in the movie. Oh, was it okay? Yeah, yeah. There's 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 ministries and organizations like that doing that work, but my personal knowledge, I don't have any because we're working with adult men. Yeah, uh, we're working with adult men who go to places where adult women and men are offering services. Got it. And in all the conversations I've had with men, which is in the thousands, I've never had a man admit or share that he struggles in that area. And, and there's not like a well-known place for that? Uh, there there may be, but that's not where not, we do ministry. You don't know yeah, right, yeah, of right. any. Okay. Yeah. That's because, that's, because that's not our primary focus. And I don't have training in that either. And I think there's a lot of law enforcement involved with that. So... I know that there's, organ again, organizations that do that, ministries that do that, um, and I think anywhere in the world that probably exists on some level. That's a great response. Right. On some level, it, right. it, it is. Um, so now, okay, you, you've made the switch, you said, since the last time we spoke, mm -hmm. um, to really trying to focus on men outside of the red light district yeah, as right. well. Right. So how are you going about finding those men? Yeah, it's interesting when you say finding those men. I think those men find us mm. because, again, we've we've gone from on the street. So that's our first initiative: ministering to men on the street. How do you how do you do that? Like, kind of give us a sure. Well, hi, my name is Chris, and I work with the MST Project. So hi is personal, right? That's what my mom taught me. My name is Chris. That's an introduction. So now you know that something more about me than just my appearance. And then three, I work with the MST Project, which is an inquisitive question, really or an inquisitive statement, because you don't know what MST is, so what's going to be your response? Yeah, what's, what's MST? What's right? MST, which is a great open door to a much deeper conversation. And that's really how we start ministry with men on the street. I stand on a street corner, public property, with another man or two, and we pray, we, we say, Lord, we know you're already here, so just bring those men that you're already working in, in their hearts. And George, I got to tell you, almost every night we do it, there's, I don't know how else to say it, except just a a divine encounter mm -hmm. where a man is like, I am going through this, or I do want to talk about this, or I am looking for, for input or, or discipleship or just somebody to talk to and to, to be a part of my life. I've seen men cry. I've seen men ask for hugs. I've also seen men not respond well. So yeah. I, I do, I do want to put that out there. <laughs> it's not, it's not a perfect night every night, Yeah, but on a consistent basis, you just see, you just see men respond. I think to the message that you're not alone, there is hope, and I'll walk that with you. Mm -hmm. Now, is, uh, we talked about this the last time, but is, are a lot of these men tourists? And if so, how do you really work with a tourist? Yeah, so I would say that with the men that we talk with, uh, yeah, some are tourists, some are long-term expats. You know, they live there, they work there, they retired there. But we live in 2023, or five years ago, 2018, 2019. Uh, there's no barrier to communicating and staying in touch with anybody. The only barrier is my unwillingness. You have social media, you have Facebook, you have Twitter, you have threads, you have Instagram, you have phone calls, Zoom, Skype. There's no barrier to being a part of a man's life except my own unwillingness to be that. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's a very powerful statement. Right. I like that. It's because, like, yeah, because there's no barrier, right? Right. I can pick up a phone, I can call for free, I can, I can use everything from emojis to text to, I mean, there's just no barrier to communicating and to making a commitment to a man. And so what I tell a man, if I, if, you know, he doesn't live in Bangkok or live in Thailand is I'll be with you for as long as it takes. And the only way I'll walk away from you is if you fire me and I have yet to be fired. Yeah. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. The, um, I think I've been close to being fired, <laughs> but I've never been fired yet. I've personally been fired by people. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, <laughs> I also work with restoring men and <laughs> so, you know, but that's a story for another day. Uh, season five. <laughs> season five. All the times I've been fired. That's going to take two seasons. So, so the, uh, yeah, so no. Now in Thailand, I, this is going to be a ridiculous question, um, but a hopeful statement in some ways. I've never been to a red light district. Mm. Uh, so that's the hopeful part. What is what is, what is uh, what is a red light district? I mean, we hear that, right? But if I, like if I was in a city, would I know like it's a red light district? Um, I mean, I think every every country has its own version of a red light district. But normally, where we work in Bangkok, it's an area, bright lights, bars, strip clubs, uh, kind of that all in a can all all in a, a a small area that can feel very overwhelming but very appealing at the same time. Curiosity. 
what is this? I've heard about it. I've seen the movie The Hangover. So there's this curiosity that brings you. But but what you're looking at is, yeah, just a, a, an area where there's a lot of people, a lot of lights, a lot of noise, a lot of sensory overload. Yet also you're talking about, again, because that area sells a certain thing, there's, there's a lot of temptation and visual opportunity as well. It's legal there? Um, you'd have to, you'd have to look that up. Yeah. Okay. I don't, I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, like I know the actual red light district in Amsterdam has mm-hmm. like actual red lights. I think. Yeah. Uh-huh. There, there's a lot of neon in these places. Okay. A lot of neon. Yeah. Like I said, it's a sensory overload. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, I've just never been. I was like, how do I know if I'm walking into the, <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think you would know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> at, at least in a lot of countries you, you would know. Yeah. Well, I yeah. mean, <laughs> you wouldn't know. Uh, as a drug user, as somebody, you know, former, you know, right. drug addict, it's like, okay, a lot of times I know people that are like, live right in the middle of the drug area. And I'm like, you know, you live, and they're like, we do? I'm like, yeah, yeah there's a dealer there. There's a dealer there. Yeah, and people yeah. don't like, right. you don't know what you're looking for. Right, right. Um, in those right. situations. Yeah. And a lot of places that I've been in, in different countries, when, when you see that red light district, you're, 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 pretty, you're pretty aware that you're in an area that you wouldn't want to bring your mother. Well, you don't know my mother. So. Well, all right. <laughs> mom, most, I'm, mom, most I'm mothers, totally most kidding. Mothers, totally, most mothers. I just, just, you know, you gotta. But, but, but you can tell. You, you can tell. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, let's get to the heart of uh, one of the things you wanted to talk about, and that is how can the church worldwide um, better create better ministries or organizations that help men become better men? Well, that's a great question. So, so, okay, so we talked about the first in- initiative, which is on the street. Our second initiative, just briefly, is Pathway to Purity, which is a book that we wrote for men who are, Christian men specifically, who are struggling with sexual purity, pornography, adultery. And because they're believers, uh, there's that shame of, I don't want to admit that this is what I'm going through. Nobody else is going through it. So it's a, it's a program that we have for men to find freedom and to walk in victory. So that's just a, a brief overview of our second initiative. I'm going to skip the third one because it's the third one that I really want to highlight and come back to. Okay. Our fourth initiative is called Restart, which is helping Christian leaders and pastors, missionaries who committed moral failure walk out an 18-month process of repentance, renewal, and restoration. Because even though you've sinned and there's some very high consequences to that sin, we believe that God can restore you. Absolutely. And when we look at the story of, of, of David and Bathsheba, not only did he sin with Bathsheba, he also murdered somebody. Sure. And yet he still remained king. Now, that doesn't mean that there were no consequences to it. But I, I think sometimes when we see pastors and, and all that fall, it's one and done. But I think if that pastor is willing to walk out a process, his spouse is willing to, to walk that process of restoration as well and and so forth, I think there's an opportunity for that for that pastor, missionary, or leader to come back into ministry. It's not a quick process, but it's not, it's not a nail in the coffin either. And so that's what we do with, with Restart. The f- third initiative is called Real Men Pursuing Purity. And George, I don't want to go through the pandemic again, but I thank God for the pandemic. Because when the pandemic happened, I got an email from someone in South Asia, and they said, look, I know you do a ministry for purity, and there's a lot of pastors in my network of, of teaching that are really struggling right now. Their churches are shut down, they're at home all the time, their marriage is fraying, and it's a really difficult time. Can you do a purity course for these pastors? So uh, in talking with this individual, we we recognize actually it's more than just a one-day talk or a one-weekend talk. It's an actual course, and the course is under our third initiative called Real Men Pursuing Purity. And what we do is we do quarterly events, and we create devotional books for each event, and we just have a, a new event every three months until Jesus comes back. We're having, actually, event 38 next month. Wow. And so we've got about another six, 700 events to go. But what we found... <laughs> I like that. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's like, it's just, I mean, right? And because yeah. as long as you remain imperfect, there's always another area of your of your life that God wants to work on. Right. And so so that's why I think there's another seven or 800 events to go. But what we found is we found that the more that we were talking to these pastors, the more that we were working with these missionaries and leaders, there's no men's ministry in the local church. Now, I know there's going to be people that say, well, we have a men's breakfast. But what I want to challenge people with is there's a difference between a ministry and an activity. Yeah. And as RMPP was growing, Real Men Pursue, 
uh, Real Men Pursuing Purity was going around the world, we began to just see more and more churches say, we have activity, but we don't have ministry. We know how to socialize, but we don't know what fellowship is. We know how to give and impart biblical knowledge, but we might have lost focus on how to disciple. Mm. And I, when we know, we, we know that we want to see a heart transformation lead to behavioral change as well. Like if you have bad behavior, you don't want to continue to condone that bad behavior. That's what we're here on tour for is to go around to these different churches and talk to different men and say, how does your men's ministry look? And do you know what I found? Most churches I go to say, we don't have one. No. Which actually blows my mind. Yeah. And I don't understand why. Because every, because every church I've gone to has usually an amazing children's ministry, right? This church shall remain nameless, but there was a church we went to that had BMX bikes, mm-hmm. Xboxes, Playstations, yeah. and a Python behind closed glass. That's an amazing children's ministry. Like, that's like almost a zoo with, <laughs> like, right? With like, like a YMCA built under the roof. And I'm like, that's amazing. And then most churches have great women's ministry. Yeah. Yet their men's ministry is almost non-existent. And that, wow. I don't know what you think about that, but that blows my mind. Yeah. Because every child has a father, and every married woman has a, has a husband, and every divorced woman used to be married. So why is there no men's ministry? I don't get it. Yeah. I don't get it at all. So what, that's, that's a great point. So what are some of the things you do? So, well, I go to the, I, you know, we talk with these churches and, and, and one of the things I share is, okay, how do we develop your men's ministry? How do we strengthen it? How do we create it? And how do we define what ministry is? Yeah. And again, what I find is most churches, they, they confuse ministry for activity. They, they look at participation and results more than transformation. Absolutely. Right? It's like we had 700 men come to our men's breakfast. Oh, praise God. If it's good breakfast, I wouldn't be surprised. But what happens after that food digest? Yeah. What happens when the, when the man goes back to his home, goes back to his community, goes back to his marriage, goes back to his responsibilities? Does he reflect Christ in all he says and all he does? And I think you can look at society today and say, probably not. All right. Mm-hmm. So what are some of the examples of the events you've put on? All right, so one of the things that I think we, we need to look at in men's ministry is to really understand what are we trying to teach men. And one of the things I've noticed is that we're, we're very comfortable giving men knowledge, but knowledge doesn't always equal transformation. Look at Pharisees, for example, mm-hmm. right? Their knowledge was bar none, the best. They had, they had amazing knowledge. They could quote scripture to you left and right, but they couldn't recognize the Messiah who was standing in front of them. And so one of the things that we teach men is it's good to study God's word. It's even better to study and apply it. And how do you apply God's word? By learning to value the things of God. And I think one of the things I I try to teach men is for us to walk in greater Christ-likeness and maturity, we don't do that because because we just learn. We do that because we learn to appreciate and to value the things of God. How do you value God's word? How do you value God's ways? How do you value God's will? And whatever you value, you'll pursue. And whatever you pursue, you'll remain committed to. But if you don't value the things of God, then you might more likely than not don't love the things of God. And if you don't love something, you're not going to remain committed to it. Right. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here as I'm, I'm like ruminating on the, on, the, in the, on the questions you're posing here. And I think, you know, um, so for me, it's like I can work with the demographic of men that I work with right. typically. Yeah. Um, although, I mean, as I'm a, you know, counselor and right. coach to all men, but historically speaking, working with men in addiction. So I can bring those, that group of men together and I can, you know, we can lay out a a men's meeting that like you're talking about men's ministry, ministry to each other, walking through confession, repentance, walking through, you know, restoration and, and reconciliation with one another, processing past trauma and and all these things. Mm. Because, you have a you have a set belief walking into that group. We're all broken, mm. addicted men. So we know that. Mm-hmm. But when you take just men in general, just right? normal church church church, attenders, churchy men, right? right? Maybe let's especially looking at the upper end of like right. maybe they're financially stable, 
Yep. Okay. Mm-hmm. Career stable. Um, what do you do? Like I'm sitting here as a pastor, as a minister. What do we do to for what would a men's if somebody was like George? What would this men's event look like if you wanted to start a men's ministry? Right. I, I I don't know. I got to go brainstorm some because right. I'm drawing a blank. Right. Right. Because I know those men, mm-hmm. and they're you know not very open to right. sharing weakness, not very right. open mm-hmm. to being transparent. Right. Basically, not very open to living the gospel, but that's a topic for another day. Season five. <laughs> Season five. <laughs> but yeah, so what, how do we differ? And you know, like, but right now, just brainstorming with you, how do we differentiate an activity from a ministry? Like, right. yeah, I can get you. Let's all go fishing. Okay, yeah, let's go fishing. Okay, yeah, let's go fishing. But what happens if I don't like to fish? Right. What happens right. if I don't like to hunt? What happens if I don't like to go to a baseball game? How do you, a ministry ministers to all men, yeah. not just to men's hobbies? And I think I think it's important for us to understand right. that you know it's I think the church is like well let's socialize because socialize is the same as fellowship. Actually, that's not true. Right. Just because I go to a baseball game and then pray at the end, that doesn't mean I fellowship. That just means I went to a baseball game and then prayed at, prayed at, the, prayed end. at the end. <laughs> that's it. So, like you, yeah. you were saying, what do you? How do you do a men's ministry to a man who has all the money he needs? Yeah. And the first thing that comes to mind is is that man finding his trust and security in his finances. And as he made an idol out of his money, that's something we all struggle with. I can struggle with where I place my trust. I can place my trust in my bank account, which is very little. I can place my trust in my own ability. And so I think you can look at, even even though things are stable, you can still minister to the areas of our heart that can drift away from God. It's the same thing with the man who has a great job, right? He's a great job. He's a CEO. Okay, but in our, in our human heart, we can drift and we can make our identity and an idol out of work. So I think in everything, even in those areas that are stable, you can still minister recognizing that the human heart can still drift away. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and still find its idol, its trust in, in things that are outside of, of God's word. Men's ministry doesn't have to only reach out to those who have been abused or suffer trauma. Men's ministry is working in those areas of our life that bring them greater connection to God, his word, his ways, his will, and preparing people how to live in this world. So let me give you an example. Yeah. So let's say that there's a guy who you say, George, has all the money he needs. Praise God. And he's like, it's not an idol. I recognize it comes from God. And God's the manager of my account. He can withdraw at any time. Great. But let's say this man also has a great job. And he's like, it's not an idol. I love Jesus. My work is simply an opportunity to pay the bills. And I'm faithful with paying my bills all the time. Praise God. But again, he's not Jesus. So there are areas that you can minister in. So some of the things that I would think of is how is your, how are your work boundaries? How's your communication? How's your, uh, how's the way that you speak to others? How's your boundaries? I think men's ministry just needs to continue to be looking at those areas of men's lives and saying, this week, we're going to talk about this. This month, we're going to talk about this. We're going to provide a safe place for you to share things that you don't feel comfortable sharing. Let me give you this example. I grew up in church. I knew how not to go deeper. I knew that I could go to church as long as I attended church, as long as I was sitting in the chair, people said, he's here. And if he's here, that must mean he's doing well. Not at all. (laughs) Not at all. Because you don't know my heart. All you see and you're content with my presence, but you're not asking me about my heart. That guy who has all the money, great. But I want to know where is your heart? Because Proverbs 4 23 tells us to guard your heart. And then Mm -hmm. Hebrews tells us, be careful that you don't drift away. Drifting away is a very slow process. You might even drift away and not even know that you're drifting. Usually. Right? And so I think men's ministry is always coming back to, it's not so much your attendance, it's not so much your activity, it's let's come back and talk about your heart. And then provide a safe place for men and I, I don't mean safe in the weird context that some people think, but a safe place to be able to say, honestly, this is what's going on. I have everything, yet I don't have a good relationship with my wife. Or I have everything and I'm feeling kind of apathetic. That scares me a little bit. I think ministry needs to be able to be a place where men can share, can talk, and can find the help, the hope, and the healing that God's word provides and promises. That's beautiful. I'm curious. So what did you mean, like, not safety in the weird? Well, you know how, like, there's safe places or something like that, you know, like if you hear a professor, there's a room that you can, oh, you know, <laughs> go and, like, cry and all that. I'm not talking stuff like that, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, I'm like, yeah. it's a weird, yeah, weird I don't know. safe. And, and, and maybe we've only heard that in Asia. I don't know. But you hear about these like campuses or whatever that's like, well, if somebody said something you don't like, there's a safe space for you to process. It's like that cry. in Asia? No, you hear it. Like I've read articles. And oh, all that. about yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it happens here. I didn't know if yeah, it happened okay. in Asia. I may need a safe space after this interview. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, um, so, okay. Uh, I mentioned before earlier that I'm, I'm working on a third book and the book is all on connection, right? And how connection is truly the answer to all the brokenness in the world. Yes. And the gospel should be that connection, but we've learned how to live out the gospel in a way that isn't that. And it's exactly what you're talking about here mm-hmm. in the sense of like a men's ministry being a place where we're truly connecting with one another. Not just about the baseball game we're going to see, the hunting trip that we're taking. The fishing uh, trip. The fishing trip. Mm-hmm. Not just about how we did with the stock market last week or mm-hmm. last month, but rather how am I doing with my personal struggles? Uh, mm-hmm. You know, what are my pain points? What are the things that I'm look, I look at in my life and they're not where they want to be? Right. How is my communication with my right. wife, with my right. children? My boundaries at work and, and all these things. Yeah. And, and actually, it could even be a thing where a man's like, I've, I've had men come to me and say, look, i got to be honest with you, I don't love God. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, uh, first off, I'm, I, I, I feel sad by that, but praise God that he has the freedom and the, the trust to be able to share that. And I think, I think when you're just focused on eating hot dogs at a Pirates game, that doesn't just necessarily bring out that, that opportunity to really minister to the whole man. Well, I think it's our human nature has always been to take things to the furthest level. And so like what, you know, began as one thing ends up over here. Mm. So I think when we originally, whoever came up with the idea of activities was never to be like, we'll use an activity to not have to connect. It was mm. meant to connect, but then people mm. just drifted further and further to right. like, I can use right. this as a, fake image that I'm doing good. I went to the men's right, baseball right, game. Right. But let's also assume that we also live in a, in a society and a culture that wants results. Yeah. Right. Well, how do you, how do you quantify results in discipleship? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I had somebody ask me, well, what's your five-year plan? And I said, I don't have one. Amen. And they said, well, what do you mean? I said, look, five-year plans are good for programs, fundraisers, and that's it. Yeah. Okay. But when you're talking about discipling, you don't have, you, I can't put it on, I can't put a five-year program on it. You know, and I can promise you this, none of us had a five-year plan that worked after 2019. Right, right. right. So all of our five-year plans at the end of 2019 went out the window. But I think so often in church, we're looking for, we're looking for something to be able to get up on stage and say, look at this, look at what we've done. And I just don't think discipleship can be, can be quantified in, in Sunday, re, Sunday result reports. You can. You know, because you're, you're, I think you're, you're talking about, what you're really talking about is learning how to love the things that God loves and learning to submit to God's word and ways and will. And I don't think you can put that into an Excel chart. You can't. And I, I think um, part of, you know, the struggle that, you know, the 14, 15 years of the type of ministry I was doing, with, especially with donors, would be like, tell me your results. And when we look at recovery programs as a whole, the results are simple. It's like, did a guy make it to a year sober, six months sober? But I'm like, that doesn't mean anything. You can white knuckle it to a year. But can a guy transform his life over the course of five years? Mm -hmm. That's a different story. Mm -hmm. But it may not look as pretty as you want on your results sheet. Did he? he, What you really want to know is... Did he stay sober, but did he get a job? Did he get a, a house? Did he get married? You know, the, you, Did he walk away from that temptation to go back to right, alcohol, right. all these kind of things? All those types of things, but a lot of times it's based on the wrong things because you're looking for markers in, a, in something that right. there isn't right. markers. And I think in men's ministry, we got to walk away from, we had 800 men come from dinner and say, look, all we know is men are created in the image of God. They're imperfect, just like women are imperfect and everybody else. Jesus calls us to be discipled, to be transformed, to live a life that honors him. So the mi- the marker of success is faithfulness and obedience. Amen. Yeah. That's the marker. Yeah. And whatever comes out of that, we just give praise to God for. George, yeah. if, if you know, when I look at the ministry that I've done, I've talked to thousands of men and I and I just share the same thing. I can't make a man change. I can share all this great truth with him, experience with him, verses with him, quotes from your book. I can do it all. Yeah. But it's ultimately him that has to make the decision to change. And it's him that has to make the decision to work at it 
and to put every ounce of energy he has into living this new lifestyle. But my faithfulness and obedience comes into play by saying, you don't have to do that alone. Yeah. And you won't do that alone. Yeah. I'll be there with you every step of the way. And, and that's the hope they need sometimes. And I just think men's ministry lacks that today. It's come, bring your body, but your heart can be far from us. Because we can say we've had 37 men come to the baseball game. Yeah. 18 men go on the fishing trip. And I remember going to a men's conference for three days. And here's what shocked me about it. We're all coming together. And we all watched a video series for three days. And I'm like, wait a minute. So this video series was in the late 90s to early 2000s. So it's like 20 years old. And there's no other way for us to connect with one another than to watch a video. And I just think, I just think so many times we mail it in mm -hmm. because it's hard work. And I've had people come to me and say, well, men's ministry won't work because men don't have the time. I said, no, that's not true. Yeah, yeah. They have the time. But they don't know how to prioritize their time. And they don't prioritize it because it's just another activity. Yeah, yeah. Why do I have to take away time from my wife or my hobbies just to go do this? Yeah. Where all that, all that's required is me just to sit there, participate, answer some questions, and say that I went. And by the way, I do get my free T-shirt at the end of the conference. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it is all in what we value, right? And I think that... So what do we value as, as yeah. men's ministry? And I think we have to value the fact that God calls us to be transformed into the image of of Jesus. Absolutely. That's, That's the key. what God calls us to. And we don't value that. Well, I, I wonder if, or, or, or maybe some people don't value that. I think that's, yeah, yeah. Obviously, right? obviously some do, of course, um, that goes without saying, but I think that, man, I'm just going back to you saying how the one guy, you know, when he said, you know, I don't love God or whatever. And like, I just thinking if I was there and somebody said that I'd say, well, tell me about the God you're talking about, because maybe right. I don't love him either. Yeah, that's a great question. Because yeah, there, there, there's a lot of good questions with, to we ask. We end up right. with these images of God. You're wrecking the place over here, man. Just <laughs> come in now. Uh, um, you know, but there, I, I think we as men, uh, you know, I hate to say that, but men typically, we get to this place where like, okay, uh, this I understand this here. Now I'm moving on. So we get this image right. of what our relationship with God mm -hmm. is or and we what we need to do. I'm thinking out loud, like how do we make men's ministry better? How do we make it happen at all? It's like helping people understand it. You can, I don't care if you've been following Jesus or God or whatever for 20, 30 years, you can still, you should still be growing regularly with God, transforming yeah. regularly with God. Until the day you take your last breath. Absolutely. I would hope until the day you take your last yes, breath. Yes. Yeah. Otherwise you've somehow settled for a lesser version of what faith was, is supposed to look like. Or, or you've come to the conclusion that all that God wants is my attendance. Yeah, yeah, right. Right? As long as I'm here, I'm checking the, te the, the, the boxes. I'm here. And I remember a man saying, I'm here. Isn't that enough? And I said, it's a good first step, but it's not the, it's not the destination. Right. Because at the end of the day, I'm reminded of the story of Cain and Abel. Okay, now this may not make sense to you at all, but to me, it makes perfect sense. And it's, it's God wants my heart more than anything. Right, like like a church can, uh, and, and we'll come back to Cain and Abel in just a minute, but a church can say, God, look at all that we're doing. Look at all the activity that we're accomplishing. And I can imagine that God would say, yeah, I see it. But I also see your heart. And I see where your heart is, and your heart is far from me. And it's the same thing, I think, like, again, with, with Cain and Abel. You have Cain who said, look, I bring you, I bring you the best. I, I'm, bringing you, I'm bringing you what I have. Isn't that enough? And I don't think God is saying, no, it's not enough because I demand more. I think God in his love says, I want the best of you. And the best yeah. of you is not what you can give me. The best of you is what you can, is your heart. I want your heart. Yeah. I want your heart. There's no activity, George, that I can do that God's like, you've made it. Yeah. You made it. God can do every activity I do best. Yeah, yeah. But he wants my heart. Yeah. He wants He wants my heart. And I think and I, I just I just have such a passion recognizing in my own life I knew how to check the boxes. I knew how to attend on Sunday. I knew how to attend on Wednesday service. I knew how to look the part, yet my heart was far from God. Right. You know, I, I you know, just thinking of, um, so with the, when I was running the Timothy Initiative and we, most of our men, you know, we had a high majority of our people that would make it to, you know, four or five years sober. And, yeah. and one of the keys is that, you know, around that year to two year mark, they fall into that 
place of like, okay, Jesus got me here. I, yeah. I'm sober now, yeah. but that like, this is it. Like, okay, now I'm, I'm a Christian. Now I can go forth, but it's like, no, you've missed the point. Yeah. The, the, growth and the transformation that God wants to put you through is never ending. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, he got you here, but don't just stop here. Right, and what right, I would right. say to, to, to my men would be like, you don't want to be five years, 10 years down the road and you're still quoting the same verses you quoted at year one. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to be five years, 10 yeah. years down the road and your, and your testimony is the same as it was right, day one. Right, right. God is always redoing our testimony. Right. He's always transforming us, telling us yes. more about himself. So you want to continually be growing. So you never get to this point where I've done all I needed to do in that area. Mm. Moving on, compartmentalize. Now I'll just I'll call myself mm. a Christian and move on. So. It's a, it's the same thing that you're talking about in in the mainstream church or you know regular you know just regular men that maybe they don't struggle with the the other bigger traumas or addictions but mm -hmm. but they just get to this point where I compartmentalize I did all I, I'm a Christian I did those things or maybe I still go on Sundays but helping people understand uh, you should constantly be hearing from God mm -hmm. my 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 spiritual father years ago before he passed away. Every time I, we would get together once a week, and we we get together, and he'd say, "George, hey, what does what is the Lord saying to you today?" He was, <laughs> he was Cuban, and and that was my worst Cuban uh, impersonation. <laughs> but he, he'd say, "What is what is the Lord saying to you this week?" Yeah, right. and and he and he and you know, I, if I started, you know, about to quote some bogus thing or whatever, no, no, what's he saying to you? Mm. God is sharing something all the time. Right. What does he right. share with you this week? Right. So it got to the point, well, be, that type of discipleship made me be like, I'm not showing up without being like, right. what is God saying? So, right. and right. he's too, and he's way more spiritual and mature than me. So I can't make it up. Right. So I need to like be in prayer. I need to be right. yes. seeking after the Lord yes. and be like, okay, God, what are you saying? And, right. you know, and then when I did show up and I'd be like, I felt like the Lord saying this and it was from the Lord. He'd be like, right. yes, that is it. You know? Right. But that type but of see, you growth the, helped but, me. But see, you hit the nail on the head. You said one on one, right? See, and I think I think you can have those like in, you know in the ministry that we do with RMPP, we have community groups, right? Groups of of men, up to six per group that meet every week to go through the devotional yeah. booklet. I think that's one aspect. I think the deeper aspect is one on one discipleship. Yeah, yeah. Because you see, and and, I, and I've met men who are like, well, I'm discipled. I I watch a YouTube video every week and I read a book. And I'm like, okay, that's not discipleship. Do you know the, Do you know why? Because disciple. Because if I read a book or watch a video and I don't like what I'm being challenged on, I can close the book, George. Yep. I can turn off the video, right? I don't like what George says on his video, so pause. Jump, jump ahead. Jump ahead. I'm going to go watch something else. I don't like what Tom wrote in his book, so you know what? I'm just going to go to the next chapter. But I bet when you were with your Cuban mentor and he challenged you on something, where do you go? Yeah. You can't tell him to be quiet. You have to, yeah. you're forced to know or to decide how am I going to respond? Right. And I think that's the part of maturity that leads to wholeness and Christ likeness. How do I respond? Our whole Christian walk is rooted in how we respond and what we steward. Mm -hmm. And I think really, beside teaching men what to value, beside encouraging men to remain teachable, you also have to teach them your whole life is how you respond and what you steward. I don't hear that in men's ministry. Right. What I hear is the same thing over and over and over again. Jesus loves you. You're his child. All truth, foundational truth, important truth. But then what? Yeah. But then what? How does knowing, okay, I know God loves me, but how do I respond in moments when I don't feel God's love? How do I respond when I'm yeah. tempted? How do I steward my influence in my home? And I think you, I think it's about taking God's word and breaking it down into easy to understand uh, tidbits for men to apply in their life. How do you respond to what's going on in the world today? How do you steward those feelings of, of temptation or uh, unholy lust or whatever or whatever you're going through? Yeah. And I think so many times where I've seen men's ministry, they just continually hit the head, the nail on the head with salvation. But how do we go from salvation to maturity? Mm -hmm. And that's the call of God for the man of God in 1 Timothy 6, yeah. 11 to 12. Every men's ministry should use 1 Timothy 6, 11 to 12 as their motto for what they want to teach their men. Yeah. 
Do but you have don't. First Timothy six eleven to twelve memorized? Not memorized, but I know what it is. Oh. Yeah, so <laughs> me too. Right? So, Not, I don't have it memorized. Which <laughs> which Bible version? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean we used it. Yeah, it was uh, part right. of the core of the Timothy. Right, initiative, it's the so. Timothy initiative. So. Yeah. So I, I just think it's men's ministry has to be rooted not in attendance, but in the pursuit of maturity. Mm-hmm. And you become mature in your walk when you value the things of God and you remain teachable to what God points out and says, I'd love to work on this. I want to mold this. I want to, I want to bring it more into an alignment with my character, my word, my ways, my will the image of my son, Jesus. Well, I'm going to, and let me just share with you, wrap up yeah. that part of uh, why I think we don't see men's ministries. Um, and, and, you know, in, in the book, the uncover I wrote about it, it's like, I, I why does big church and big recovery not work? And it's the same right. reason. And it's the same reason it doesn't work in the men's ministry is because we've wanted to systematize things in order mm-hmm. to fill seats. I and agree. so yes. when you said that about the one-on-one, and I love what you said, we have groups that are no more than six. I've, I've gotten myself in so much trouble lately because I've, I've flat out said to pastors, then you need to have a smaller church. Because what you're really <laughs> telling me is you yeah. can't pastor the amount of people yeah, you have. Right. You can teach them, yeah. but there's a difference between teaching and pastoring. It's like, I don't have time. When you, when you start going down that road of like, I don't have time for my congregants, yes. then you don't, you shouldn't have that big of a church. Mm. Okay. And so when we run into these problems with men's ministry, why do we do things like baseball games and softball games? Because it's easy to, to do 50 people that way yes. and not have to actually do anything. You can have one men's, you know, pastor who over, and then he can just, as long as he can somehow fill a bunch of seats mm. and so but nothing happens there's no discipleship there's no none of that just like big discipleship in america it's, it's fallen victim to checklist and videos mm-hmm. um you know coffee meetings for groups of men yes. it's what they what we really want is the ability to make sure we get as much tithe for the church Okay, and that means people, and so I need to get as many people in, and with as few actual pastors over them. Mm. And so, why don't we see men's ministries in the church? I would say because most churches don't want to actually do what they need to in order to make it work. Mm. They want to make sure they can have a lot of men do certain things so they can say. We have a men's ministry. Mm. We go to see the Bucks play. We go do this game. We do that game. Mm. We have lots of activities. Why? Because we can charge for those activities, mm. for one, and then church gets a cut of that charge. And, and listen, I've been in ministry in America for a long time, mm. so I'm not just talking things I don't know anything about. I know about these things. Mm. Just like you said, there's a kid's ministry with BMX bikes and video games and a python behind the glass wall. Those same churches probably aren't giving any money to the poor and to those that Mm, need mm. because they're putting it within the walls of how they can make sure they get their money at the end of the month. Mm -hmm. And so what we really need to do is to break free from the idol of what we've 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 made church into being Mm. and really say we need to strip it down and get back to what Jesus said. And really, how do we follow the heart of the Father? And how do we live out a relationship with one another Which and God? Go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. Not but discipleship attendees. Is, but George, <laughs> I, I don't know how much longer we have, but discipleship is hard. And I think that's yeah, another it's very reason hard. that we don't have men's ministry. It's, it's yeah. because it's it's really, really hard because you can't you can't force change. And, and now I'm going to say something that, yeah, God, no, God help me, but... I think kids ministry is easy because you can tell kids what to do. Absolutely. Okay. You can tell kids what just to do. Just entertain them. Sit here, go there. Don't do that. Put your hands out of your nose and just eat this snack. Yeah. I love kids ministry because I recognize the importance of it, but discipleship is harder than just activity yeah. activities and people don't respond to discipleship and discipleship I think is a long-term movement as well. Yeah. You, you can't say, well, you know, there's those books, six weeks to being a disciple. Please don't buy that book. <laughs> okay. Because it's a lifelong commitment yeah. Yeah. To, to valuing, to submission, to teachability, to molding, to pursuing maturity. And, and I think it's just, it's really, really hard work mm-hmm. and it's easier to go to the Bucks game yeah. than it is to sit down with a man one-on-one like your Cuban mentor and say, 
Thomas or Bob or whatever your name is, that's sinful, and we need to talk about that. Yeah, you know, you can't yeah. you can't speak like that to your wife. You can't you you you've made an idol out of this, mm-hmm. or or whatever or you know whatever issue may come up. Yeah. But working through that, it's a lot harder than just you know, yeah, eating pancakes on Sunday. Discipleship is hard, and I think that you you hit the nail on the head with that one because it's it the reality is listen we want to transform our lives right or you would we, hope so yeah yes and and so no one ever said that was going to be easy mm-hmm. it's like it, it, you I, you know I, i'm such a you know believer in that you know how we're saved by you know our grace and mm-hmm. the you know faith and you know not our works but yet there's work to be done Mm-hmm. Okay. There is. There's there is work right. to be done to be better men to be, yes. uh, and, and ultimately we look at all the ministries in the world, and we can say that if we had better men's ministries, those ministries wouldn't be necessary. Mm-hmm. So I I know for me and you and the work that we've done for all these years, if men were ministered to better and better men, then we wouldn't have to do mm-hmm. these types of ministries. And you wouldn't see a movie like The Sound of Freedom that has to come out. Right. Right? Exactly. And I exactly. think it, I think it all begins in the I think it all begins in the church. And it's interesting. Like we work in a in a Asian country, and the pastor told me once he's like, Chris, do you know what church is in my country? And I said, No. He's like, It's a place for women and children. Men look at church in, in this particular country as a place that that's not where I belong. That's where women belong and yeah. children belong. And I find that heartbreaking because I think so many of the issues that we face today require strong men yeah i don't mean strong like muscular or d type personalities or a type personalities i'm talking strong like jesus yeah you can be strong and empathetic and tender and kind and gentle but strong in character strong in integrity strong in value strong in standing up for what is right Mm -hmm. and um i think churches i think men's ministry has an opportunity before it today to develop strong men, not men who know how to argue. We're not looking for argumentative men. You know, that's not strong. But again, strong in character, strong in Christ-like living maturity and, uh, and, and, and really your heart. You know, I think me and you, maybe we get, we have a side project to do together because Uh-oh. I no, I've really, this has been on my heart for the last, especially the last few days. Um, because there's this polarity that's happening in the world where, you know, you're either left or right or mm. center or whatever. But, mm. you know, so the, he, this, uh, what's the guy's name? An, uh, Andrew Tate? What's... Oh, the guy that got arrested in Romania? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Uh-huh. So you got all these people very, that are... Very toxic, by the way. Yes. Mm. Thank you. Um, but people that are like, yes, we need to be stand up. But it's like, we need to meet people like you and myself to come together and figure out like, how do we present manlyhood in a way that is empathetic and loving, but strong. Right. So it's not like we have to be walked all over nope. and, 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 you know, you, to be a man now, you can't speak loudly and you can't do this. It's like, no, but just to speak loudly doesn't make me a man. Mm. So there's a difference. Just to argue, just to yell, just to be right. rude, rude, or a jerk. Does not make me a man. It doesn't make you a man. It makes you an immature boy, though. But right. what I will right. say, yeah, I, I agree with you. And and look, who's the best man to emulate after? Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you find someone better than Jesus, let me know. And, and somehow it's it's got to be all of this or all of that. But where do we find somebody to, to really right. direct men back to just being like strong, empathetic, loving, caring men that lead their household, that lead their families. That love uh, the Lord. That love the Lord, that, that are willing to yes. be transformed, mm-hmm. willing to continue to grow. Right. Because, you know, you can't just loving, you know, leading your family. You can't be, you, you follow Jesus to the day you get married. And then you're like, well, that got me married. So now... It's like I'm not going to grow anymore in Christ, right. but I'm going to be strong and a right. jerk to my family because. Yeah. Right. So it's like no, we have to we have to come up with a way to grow, continue the willingness to want to continue to grow, to mm-hmm. want to transform, to love the things that bring on that transformation. Right. Uh, I'm just sitting here really processing as you're speaking. I have a feeling it's this freaking. podcast is going to turn into a project. Yes, that's yeah. what I'm is sitting that, here. I'm is, like, that, is that what's happening? Yeah, that's what's ha- that's what's <laughs> happening because it's so necessary. And I'm like, yeah. I'm I'm with you. I mean, I'm 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 with you on everything you're saying. It's like, um, and you still come with the 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 vigor of like, no, church, we need to do better. Where sometimes 
I'm here, so I get burned so many times. You're just like, you want to just throw your hands up and be like, I'll just do better. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, I, I can see the frustration, right? Like, and you know, and I go to church, and, and look, if there's somebody who I know that's watching this podcast is like, Chris, you're talking about my church. I'm not mad at the church. I'm not, I'm not mad. I'm not bitter. Right. I'm not even frustrated. I'm just like, there's this passion that, oh, there's something better. There's something There's better. something better. There's something deeper, better, more more amazing that God has for us. Mm-hmm. And I and I think that it's that passion to say, let's embrace that. Let's pursue that. Let's want that, right? The status quo, we can continue to do that, right? Fair enough. You know, it's not the worst thing, but there's something better. And if Jesus, and if God has something better, then don't we want that? You know, don't, don't, don't you want the best that God has? No? Yeah. And here's the thing. So, we're in this building right now, and I didn't get to part, and it's good. We'll talk about it on the podcast because it's important. Um, because the option, the other option is churches shut down. Hmm. And so in Tampa, I was starting to tell you how the cost of living is so high here. Hmm. So we're in this building that is, a, it was a church, and the person who started it said, I'm tired of seeing churches get shut down and sold to Walmart mm. because it happens mm. for lots and lots of money mm. because property is so expensive. So these churches with that were once flourishing with four or 500 people that are down to 20, all of a sudden they're being offered $6 million by Walmart. Mm. So why not sell? So he bought this building and this, and it's both these huge buildings we're in right here currently and said, I want to make it into a co-op space, but I don't want to lose the church value. So I'm going to rent it out f- at a very low price for like a per scale price for churches that are, have nowhere to meet anymore. Mm-hmm. So like actually six churches use, utilize oh, the wow. space mm-hmm. that would have formally closed down Wow! because they're trying to figure out a way to stay open and represent Jesus and, mm-hmm. and still do these things that, you know, bring the gospel to the people that they're reaching. And so it's like, we have to get better. We have to, we have to strive to be better, to be better, have better men's ministries and be better all the way around to represent right. Jesus in a way that is, right, right. that is just better than, than what we've done, but also not to just shut our doors and give up yeah. because mm-hmm. that's the other option that so many churches, right. especially I'm here in Tampa, um, people are doing because there's money yeah. to be made by mm-hmm. shutting the doors and selling. And, and none of that, but when you shut a church door, I think you also communities and families are impacted. Marriages are yeah. impacted. Relationships are impacted. Future generations are impacted. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Society, every, everything is impacted. So yeah, I think there's an opportunity for men's ministry to be better. I think there's an opportunity for men's ministry to grow. And I mean, there's so many churches I've been to where there's, I just, I can't believe it. There's no men's ministry. Well, let's share. So yeah. you're on a 50... 58 city tour. 58 city tour. We're on You've city been 41. here. Mm-hmm. You're on 41. Mm-hmm. You've been, you got to America when? Uh, we arrived March 30th and began the tour on April 1st. We needed a few days to get over jet lag. That's the, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so it, we'll cut we, you we, we need a little grace there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so you're on the 41st city. For, uh, yeah, we're off to 42 uh, next week. Uh-huh. Wow. And so then... You continue on, and you'll be in America until November? Uh, October 1st, and then we'll head back to Thailand. And and uh, so the, really what we're doing is just kind of sharing kind of that heart, me- mentoring men one-on-one. I've had a, actually a couple men over the last few months reach out to me and be like, hey, I, I, I really want some one-on-one mentorship, you know, and they've shared different things. And I think that's beautiful, you know, and, and I, I don't mind them reaching out to me. I'm grateful for it. I'm, I'm thankful but also, I'd love for them to also feel like they can go to their church and say, hey, I need that one-on-one mentorship. And so to kind of just wrap up my part is I think men's ministry can be effective when men in the church say, let me find another man and let's walk together. Right. You know, I, I enjoy the group. Praise God. I love the group. The breakfast, so be it. Bacon is good. But I'm looking for that one-on-one mentor, that Paul and Timothy relationship, that Jesus and, and Peter kind mm-hmm. of relationship. And I think if men can find that other man, not not somebody who agrees with you politically or loves the Yankees like you do or whatever baseball team or football team you love, but can you find another man in the church that says, he looks like Jesus and I want to look like him? Yeah. The Apostle Paul says that, follow me because I follow Christ. Right. So if you want your men's ministry to succeed, your men need to be able to look like Jesus and lead others to look like him as well. Yeah. And if you don't have men that look like Jesus, then it may be a red flag to say, we might need to do some things different here. Yeah. 
So you're in America, you're doing these things. You're also raising money and awareness for your ministry, which yeah, is a powerful right. ministry. That's I right. highly recommend people give to your ministry. So tell them about how they can get in contact with you and the resources that are available to them right? and yeah. all the all the yeah. things that come with that. That's great. You know, every anybody can go to our website, which is themstproject.com. All of our resources are, are on our website. They're available for free. And, and here's the reason why, George. God has worked in my life for free, right? I mean, God, you know, when I was dealing with stuff, you know, God wasn't like, okay, now, Chris, I'd like to work in your life, but it's going to be three payments of ninety nine ninety nine. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like, you know, God's QVC over here, right? Yeah. So all of our resources for any man or woman that are interested, they're all available for free. You can download, use it, be blessed by it. There's ways to give online, and uh, there's ways to watch some of our videos and read some of our blogs and just kind of see our heart to direct people back to God's word and uh, and to find that help, hope, and healing that we all need on some level. Absolutely. And the website again is? TheMSTProject.com. TheMSTProject.com. So highly recommend you check it out. And if you if you feel moved by what Christian has said here today, um, give to the organization. He's been doing this work for 21 years. It's amazing work, and the resources that you can that you can utilize, um, like you said, probably would be charged uh, three payments for ninety nine ninety five <laughs> somewhere else. But it's all free. But it's all free, and so. Um, including the one you were talking about with the fallen leaders and everything is available for free. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. We, uh, we offer one-on-one -on -one mentorship to any man around the world. Our time is free. Our mentorship is free. There's nothing uh, that we charge for. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. Now people like, I, I will say like, if you want to give a donation, that's fine. But to start a program, to go through a program, to download anything. Um, no, that's great. It's all free. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, anything else? I just want to say thank you for your time, and I think we have a project to work on. I know. We do. Yeah. We really do. So <laughs> this this is the beginning. So, right. Christian, thank you so much, man. Thanks, George. I Thanks. appreciate you, your time, and this has been a great conversation. It's really it's got me thinking. Yeah, and thank so you. Hopefully it'll thank get you. other people as well. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Everyone, till the next time, peace. Thank you.